This is chapter four, lesson two and three for AP Stats. Uh, here we're looking at experiments and then overall uh, lesson three, looking at how to be responsible and ethics with regards to experiments and studies. So as you watch this video, please keep in mind, what are the qualities of an observational study and an experiment? So what are similar and what's different about them? Uh, what advantages, what are the advantages of each and what do each require in order to be carried out? Um, so be sure to describe similarities and differences when you get to this on the free response. So let's look at these uh, first aspects. We have a study. Um, it's observing individuals and measuring variables of interest without influencing responses. Okay, So that means like we're just basically collecting data. Whereas an experiment, we are influencing the response in some way. We're imposing a treatment on the in individuals. Whether we are changing the wording of a question, whether we are giving a placebo drug and a real drug, to uh, randomly assigned, randomly chosen and randomly assigned groups, um, we are exposed, imposing some sort of treatment. And that is the key difference between a study and an experiment, that we're imposing some sort of treatment in order for an experiment to be carried out. Uh, an experiment's the only way we can have fully convincing data that a treatment's effective. A study cannot show us that. It might, studies might be carried out in order to see if we should pursue an experiment in order to prove it, but a study can't necessarily prove anything uh, because it's just collecting data, we don't know what lurking variables exist, and uh, and groups haven't been randomly assigned. We're going to get into that in just a second. So uh, let's look at the uh, an example of what I mean by uh, experiment being the only effective way to to look at this. So observational studies were conducted that taking hormones reduced the risk of heart attack in women by 35 to 50 percent. So this is just a study collecting data. Um, so that prompted an experiment, because that's a significant number. That's an incredibly significant number, right? That's um, over a third to a half. So that's a big difference it looks like it causes. So they, they assign, randomly assigned women to one of two groups by coin flip, uh, with one group receiving hormones and the other dummy pills. And that's what we call placebo. So that way they don't know if they're getting the treatment or not. Uh, so they can account for the placebo effect. Um, so age and hospital visits or year, hospital visits per year could be lurking variables, and they'd require blocking if we included women of all ages in the study. So we could block, meaning we could separate them into groups before we randomly assign them. We could separate um, into different age groups and separate by hospital visits per year. And then within each of those subgroups, we could randomly assign half to the hormones and half to the dummy pill. Now, several experiments with women of different ages agreed that hormone replacement did not reduce the risk of heart attack. And so these treatments declined quickly. Now, the lurking variables were income level of education. So women who chose to take hormones uh, could afford to do so. And so the lurking variable was that they saw doctors more often. They had a higher level of education. Perhaps that led to higher income that could lead to being able to buy healthier foods. So that was a lurking variable. So a study sh seemed to show that hormones were effective. An experiment showed that they were not. So a study could be misleading. So lurking variable is a variable that's not accounted for in the study that affects the response variable we're trying to measure. So oftentimes there's lurking variables, we just try to minimize them. Confounding occurs when we can't distinguish the effects of two or more variables from each other, which is why we only want one independent, one explanatory variable. Uh, we don't want to have multiple explanatory variables because we don't know which one's causing the response variable to change. So well-designed experiments are going to be the key to preventing confounding from lurking variables. So treatments imposed upon experimental units, those could be people. Um, when they're people, we call them subjects, or they could be uh, something else we're looking at, like cookies in the oven. Uh, treatment can be a combination of specific values of explanatory variables. Each experiment should identify one explanatory variable to test. If we have others, we should test them in separate experiments. Um, and then we can also account and prevent confounding. We can account for these other variables by stratified random sampling. So we can take an SRS from different groups. If we think gender is a confounding variable, a lurking variable, uh, we could take an SRS from female and male groups. So we could stratify uh, our groups beforehand. Now, if we separate groups like that for an experiment, we call it blocking, which means we separate into two blocks or two or more blocks, and then we randomly assign within those blocks. So random assignment is key. Let's take a look at what I mean by random assignment. So here we're looking at whether um, hot water or cold water is more effective at cleaning dirty laundry. Um, we think that 
um, one lurking variable might be whether it's light colored clothing or dark co colored clothing. So before we carry out this experiment, we separate. So here's our, here's our whole population of laundry. We separate into light and dark colored clothing. Or that's our whole sample, that is. Our sample's already been chosen. Many pieces of dirty laundry separate into light colored clothing, dark colored clothing. Then we carry out the experiment for light colored clothing. We randomly assign. We could use a random number generator. Um, we could use a rand int on your calculator. You could flip a coin. Uh, but you want even groups or as even as possible. So if we have 40 pieces of laundry, you'd want 20 cold, 20 hot, or somewhere close to that if it's an odd number like 19 and 20. Uh, and then we carry out the experiment here, compare uh, the cold water and hot water's effectiveness within light colored clothing. Then we can compare it within dark colored clothing. And then we can also compare these to each other. So to see if cold water and dark colored clothing was more effective than hot water and light colored clothing. This is called blocking. Assignment to blocks is not random. It's based on a quality that we think might confound the study, a lurking variable, like in here, in this case, the color of clothing. So when we do this with a study, it's called stratified random sampling. When we do it with a, an experiment, we call this blocking because we're separating into blocks. That's a key difference to know that will pop up on quizzes and tests and as we go forward throughout the year in many situations. So random assignment is key uh, in order to balance out and account for other lurking variables we might not have thought of. Um, for example, in the group with the hormone treatment, random assignment helped separate, um, separate those things out. Or we could have blocked for income level and hospital visits and then compared. Um, random assignment should help us to get uh, an even number or close to an even number if we have a large sample size in each group. So even if we've not accounted for a lurking variable, it should hopefully give us two groups that just by chance by assigning them randomly to each group that are very comparable. Um, Rather than if we decided all of these people went in one group and one of these people went in another group, if we just decided that arbitrarily or based on something else, that's another lurking variable. So we can do flip a coin, which is a good one to use, especially if you're talking about answering a question for a quick answer. So heads goes to one group, tails goes to another. That's only going to work, obviously, if you have two groups. Drawing names out of a hat, table D, or technology, like a, a number generator online or rand int on your calculator. Uh, pause right now and use rand int. So try randint 1, 30, and that'll generate random number from 1 to 30. Key principles of experimental design, control. We have to control for lurking variables that might affect response, so we can compare two groups in a systematic way. And then we can be sure that our results are caused by explanatory variable, our treatment, you know, the whatever we change in our explanatory variable, and not lurking variables. So we control for lurking variables by having two groups put together randomly. Um, we randomly assign experimental units to treatments. Uh, this uses chance to assign groups and should create roughly equivalent groups just based on chance. So, and this would make it more likely to mirror, mirror the characteristics of a population uh, and balances effects for any lurking variables. You want to be able to use enough experimental units so you have replication, so it's not just five people, because there could be a lot of things that happen by chance with small, uh, small sizes. So generally in each group, we're going to use 30 as a baseline number, at least 30 in each group. Can, things that can go wrong, um, you want to treat all the subject exper exper experimental units the same. So you want uh, people that are, if people are getting, one group's getting a drug, the other group should get a pill that looks exactly the same that's not the drug, like maybe a sugar pill. Sometimes we see the placebo effect where people think they're taking something that will prove some aspect of their condition um, so they feel better because they think they're getting something. Uh, it's key to make these experiments double blind. Double blind means neither the person that's receiving the treatment, the person in the study, knows if it's a placebo, nor the person giving it to them. So the doctor doesn't know whether they're giving them a placebo or the drug, and neither does the patient. Sometimes if the doctor knows, that can influence things. The person can figure it out from looking at the doctor. That can complicate things. So, um, or if it's a medical study, maybe the doctor feels like inclined to give them the one that's not a placebo because they think it might work, but that would that would throw off our whole experiment. So double blind means neither the person giving the treatment, administering the treatment, nor the person receiving it knows. We're ultimately looking for stati statistical significance. So an observed effect, a difference between the two uh, randomly assigned groups that's so large that it would rarely occur by chance. So our drug for reducing heart attacks has to be effective because 25% of the people in there had a reduced uh, cholesterol, a reduced bad cholesterol reading as a result. 
Um, that's the idea of statistical significance. If an effect's so large, it couldn't have just happened by chance. So keep in mind, blocking uh, is when you're, you're separating the experimental units in some way based on something that you think might affect the, their response to the treatments. So like if we separated women in that study by income levels and then assigned randomly there, then we could account for lurking variables. It's different from stratified random sampling since blocking only occurs in experiments and during random assignment, where stratified random sampling, you break them into the populations into groups and then you take an SRS from each group. In blocking, you'd already have an existing amount. It'd be for random assignment. You'd separate them into two blocks and then randomly assign within those. When we do that, we call it a randomized block design. Uh, some more info here on the example we talked about with light colored and dark colored clothing. Another way to count for these lurking variables is a matched pairs design. So similar experimental units and you get one and decide chance to see which one gets the first treatment and which one gets the second. Twins, identical twins would be ideal for matched pairs design because you control for all kinds of lurking variables by them being identical in genetic code. Um, and take a look at when we get to the heart beating activity in class, we'll use another clever match pairs design strategy. So here's your multiple choice question. Please pause here to read it over uh, and decide whether this is an observational study, a match pairs experiment, completely randomized experiment, randomized block design but not match pairs because uh, match pairs is a type of block design or stratified random sample. Uh, and then the video will continue with a brief minute about lesson three which is about ethics. So pause now answer the multiple choice, and then play the video. So this lesson 4.3 is pretty quick, but it is really important to the AP test and in general to using statistics in the world. So what allows us to determine cause and effect and what allows us to generalize our results to a larger population? So SRS, simple random sample, if individuals were randomly selected, we can make an inference about the population from which we chose them. Because they were randomly selected, they should be representative. If not, we cannot make an inference about the population. Keep in mind, like when you guys pull seniors for your chapter 4 project, you can only apply that to Sacred Heart seniors or Sacred Heart juniors if you're using juniors. You can't apply that to seniors in all of San Francisco because kids at our school might be, there might be a lurking variable based on them being kids at our school. Uh, what about generalizing our results? What about cause and effect? So random assignment accounts for cause and effect. If we randomly assign to groups, we can make an inference about cause and effect. Did the explanatory variable cause the response variable to change because we can because we have a treatment group and a control group to compare for lurk control for lurking variables, we can figure out that um, cause and effect. So if we want to generalize to the population, we need to make sure we have an SRS. If we want to find cause and effect, we need to make sure we have a random, random assignment. So goals of our well-designed experiment, changes in explanatory variable, it should tell us that cause changes in the response variable. That's what we want. Sometimes we have lack of realism. Maybe do the subjects, treatments, or the environment. Like we're looking at like distracted driving. We obviously can't have people be seriously distracted in a real outside case because they could get hurt, killed, hurt other people. So some things you can't really do. Examples, sleep deprivation lead to a higher likelihood of sickness. You can't make people not sleep. You can't make people get in risky situations or you can't force people to smoke. So we have to look at studies for that instead. So we can't ethically assign people to those treatments. You can't make people go to church. You can't make people go uh, smoke cigarettes. So we have to look for a strong association that's consistent. And larger values of the explanatory variable are associated with stronger responses. Uh, and then the cause precedes the effect in time. For example, somebody has to smoke before they get cancer, not get cancer and then smoke. And that the alleged cause is plausible. So scientifically, we know smoke goes into the lungs. It could cause lung cancer. So when we don't have an ethically sound experiment, these are the things we look for. And this is some basic things on e ethics. This is not covered on the AP test. So you, we have review boards and informed consent and confidentiality to, to protect people that are in an experiment. OK, so think about the differences between a study and experiment. Think about how they're similar. Uh, think about what random really means and how it plays into this part. And then answer the free response question.